Well, this morning we're going to um, dive into uh, James, and we've been in a study of the book of James, and, and I'll let you know we're going to be looking at a, a challenging passage this morning in James chapter 5. We're looking at James 5, verses 13 through 16, and, and I will acknowledge it's a passage that, um, that a lot of people have different opinions on, and, and I do want to, you know, we have periodically have had a, a question and answer time that we try to do on Facebook Live and our church community page in Facebook Live. If this is a passage that you would like to go a little deeper on, you'd like more discussion, uh, please feel free to join us this, this afternoon at 3 o'clock on Facebook Live. Uh, it, it may be something where it's like, okay, what do we, t- you, know, we you know, we want to have more interaction. You want to qu- ask questions. And uh, so we'd invite you to be a, a part of that, allowing us to go a little deeper than what, um, or kind of more interactive as well. And uh, so that's going to be that time. But it is a, it's a very relevant passage. Uh, let me begin by reading as we're going to look at this morning, James uh, chapter 5, starting in 13. Is any of you suffering? Let him pray. If anyone's cheerful, let him sing praise. If any among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. May God bless the reading of his word. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege that we do have to come together this morning. Father, to be able to dive into this passage, thank you for its practicality, for just, for what's here. Father, thank you that you continue to allow me to be able to understand your word. And Father, for the way that you teach me through this process, and now I pray that you get me out of the way. Father, help me to be used of you to be able to teach so that we would not only understand, but Father, know how to apply these principles to to our lives, to our crises. I pray your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning, as we've said, we're looking at verses that are teaching on subjects that, that are kind of more controversial. Um, you know, it deals with issues of sickness and prayer and supernatural healing. And, and there are different people that have different views, even amongst the people that attend this church. We have a broad diversity, and so I'm sure that we have people that are on pretty much all sides of this view, and maybe you've heard this passage taught in a way that's a little different than what I'm going to try to share this morning. And, um, and these, these issues, they're not foundational to who, you know, they're important, but, but we also want to recognize that we allow diversity. But I want to try to explain how we see this passage and why, and, and from Scripture. There are differences, and, and for some, we might know some people that we've seen that have very public ministries that are all around faith healing and claiming they have you know, the, the, you know, this gift of healing. And so here in Akron, I mean, many of us know of Ernest Angeli, and and, and his whole ministry is built around faith healing uh, on, a, on a national scale. There's a number of people, probably one of the best known is Benny Hen, and, and, uh, and again, he's known for this ministry. And there are many people who follow these teachers, uh, but there are also many other Christians who view them with a lot of skepticism. Not only what they do, but even what they believe. And, and there are some that will go to the other even side of the extreme who would say that, well, any supernatural, any kind of supernatural healing, well, that's something that God did back in the early church. That's something when, when the apostles were alive, but God still has power, but he doesn't demonstrate it in the same way. So there's a broad diversity on this issue, and we've got to ask, okay, does God heal today? And when we look at this passage where it talks about healing, what is it calling us to? What is it calling us to when we, it says that we should pray for healing and anointing with oil and, and there seems to be a promise that the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. What is that promising? Does this passage even apply to us today? Well, we've got to look at, at those issues this morning. And again, so we're looking at something that we acknowledge that there are some differences. It's controversial, but it's important. So let's dive into it. But I want to start as we dive into it by acknowledging that what we're going to be looking at is, is a broader issue. So we may, we may see it primarily as you know, prayer for sick and healing, and, and that's a big part of it, but we're going to see that there's a broader issue about prayer and what James is teaching about the importance of prayer and the purpose of prayer. And, and he comes back at the end and he really develops that. We're going to look at that in a few weeks. 
But even look at what he begins with in verses 13 and 14. It says, if any of you is, is any among you su suffering, let him pray. If anyone's cheerful, let him sing praise. If any of you amongst you is sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him in the, with oil in the name of the Lord. Now again, when we read this, I think we right away think, okay, if you're sick, you call the elders. But that's not all that he's talking about. He's teaching, when should we pray? He says, what? When we're suffering. When we're cheerful. When we're sick. All of those times. It's not only in the bad times, it's not only when we have the crisis, it's not only when we're sick, but it's saying even in the good times, we need to see prayer as something that is, that is broader, this relationship with God. See, it's not just a command to pray, it's actually teaching something about the nature of prayer, something about how God wants us to approach him. Let me try to illustrate this point just as we think in, in human relationships. You know, because a lot of times we try to understand something and our relationship to God, it's a little harder, but we understand the same thing in human relationships. There are some people in our lives that if they came to us and they asked you for something significant, your response would be, I'm glad you asked. Boy, I'm glad to help. You know, we almost feel honored that you shared that need with me. There are other people that if they came with the exact same request, you would feel used. You'd feel frustrated. And why is that? Well, the first group of people are people that you have a relationship with. There are people who want to spend time with you. There are people that pursue that relationship in good times and in bad times. In fact, when things are going well, they'll call you and they'll tell you, hey, there's good stuff that happened. They, they want to tell you those things. They want to rejoice with you. And with the people that have that relationship, when they come to you with a need, like, I want to give that need. I want to help meet you. Thanks for asking because I'm giving to you as a, an expression of the relationship that we share. Now, on the other hand, there are people who don't have that relationship and that come to you only when they have a need. You know, when things are going well, when they don't have a need, you don't hear from them. You know, they, you know there could go months, years that you hear nothing, but as soon as there's a crisis, they're going to call you up and say, hey, can you help me out with this? The only time they ever call you is when they're asking for something. And you look at that and you say, they don't want a relationship. All they want is to use you. And when they come and they keep asking, you know, you, that's where you feel frustrated. You feel used because you know it's not about relationship for them. The difference is you sense that one person loves you. One person values you and the relationship that you have. The other person really doesn't value the relationship. They just want to use you. Now, think about this now in our approach to, to God in prayer. See, what, would, what the Bible's teaching here is that God wants us to approach him not just when we're sick, but when we're, things are good, when we're rejoicing. When do you pray? If we think honestly about where we are in God, when do we pray? When do we come to God in prayer? If it, is it only when we're in trouble? Only when we have sickness? Only when we have crisis? Or do you pray when you're happy and when things are going well in addition to that. See, if we look at it and we have no thought of God, we never come to him when things are good and we only come to him when things are bad, are we just like the person who tries to use us? Are we, in the same way, not valuing God? We're just trying to use him for what he can do. Is it true that we really don't want a relationship, we just want what he can provide for us? And just like with, with us, if we have people that, you know, that come and they say all the right things in that moment of need and we're not fooled by them because we can see in their behavior they are just really trying to use us, so in the same way we don't fool God if we pay no attention to him, we only come to him in crisis. God knows that in our heart we're just trying to use him. So as we said before, what is the purpose of prayer? It's about relationship. God wants a relationship with us. And so he calls us to pray, to seek after him, not only when we have a need, but all the time, when we're happy, when things are tough, when things are, you know, when we have a crisis. Now, that being said, let me confess something. I know this as a principle, but I'm guilty of not living it out personally. Because the fact of the matter is, if I'm honest... I'm like probably many of us, where I pray more when I'm in the moment of crisis than I do when things are good. 
when things are bad, when things are terrible, that's when we, that's when we cry out. That's when we, we're driven towards God. None of us have us figured out. He's teaching a principle, but it's also in the context of grace, of recognizing the fact of the matter is, we often come all, all the time, you know, more in crisis. In fact, you see this even throughout the Bible. You see, look at Jesus. How many people came to Jesus when there was a physical crisis? Jesus, heal me. I'm seeking healing. See, here's what we need to realize. Number one is there's a principle, but God's also gracious. And in that grace, God will often use a crisis to make us aware of a need. He'll, he'll make us, he'll give us a physical need, an emotional need, a relational need, something that's bigger than we are, and suddenly we cry out, God, I need you. God, we're praying. And God's using that crisis to make us aware of a need, but he's pointing us to another need. That, that the physical need that we often have is actually more of a symptom of this deeper need. We have this, this spiritual need, this relationship with God, and God's saying, okay, come to me for the help with this, this need that you see, but I'm trying to point to this need behind it, this deeper spiritual need. He's trying to get our attention so that we seek after him, we recognize we need him, and in the process that we need, realize not only do we need his healing or do we need his help, but we need his relationship. He's dealing with the crisis, but he's trying to help us realize that out of that physical crisis, we need not only healing, we need, a, we need spiritual healing. So even think about James chapter 1, and in the beginning it talked about trials, and, and the whole idea of trials is what? Trials makes us aware of, of, of our need for faith. We, it grows our faith. God uses these crises for spiritual things. Again, I also mentioned a moment ago that this is about a bigger issue of prayer. And, and a he, huge part of it is about he, prayer of healing. And we're going to focus on that this morning. But I also realize that it's, as we're going to see in a couple weeks, that the whole passage really is dealing with prayer in general, crisis. And we, we are in the middle of a, a physical crisis, and we have a disease, and we have concerns, and, but we're in, in, in need of a spiritual crisis as well. I mean, is there any question that our country is really, we're at a place where we need a miracle? And I want to let you know that, that that's the bigger focus here. We're going to come back to this in a couple weeks, and we're going to say, how do we seek God's grace in prayer, not only for our physical need, for our, our immediate crisis, for our country? And I'm going to say, how, are, you going to, are we going to commit as a church to pray in this time? Because we need prayer. We need God. And I don't want to mention that because just to plant that seed, to ask, to ask you to be thinking about, okay, God, how, do, how am I going to pray? But this morning, let's focus really on these couple verses and, and this idea of, of healing prayer, prayer and sickness. And what I want you to see as we look at this, that it teaches us that in this healing prayer, there are certain elements that it's calling us to, uh, to be, be a part of this prayer. In verse 15, it says it should be a prayer of faith. And in verse 14, it should include anointing with oil. What does that mean? And verse 16, it says it should include the confessions of sin to each other. And how do we understand this? Well, let's look at them one at a time. Verse 15, first of all, what does it say? The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Now, what is the prayer of faith? What does that mean? Again, there's different opinions about this, and different people have had different ideas. And, and again, before we really talk about what it means, let me take a moment and say what I think it doesn't mean. I think there are some people that have come to wrong conclusions and have taught wrong things that I think are inconsistent with, with the whole of the Bible. And so let me start by saying a wrong idea of what I, it doesn't mean, that it's sometimes there's some confusion. You see, some people teach that the prayer of faith is to have certainty. It's to, in a sense, to have this faith that we work ourselves in this mindset that we have no doubts, that we have total trust, that, if, that basically, God, if I come to you with this total faith, then, then you will work. And uh, if I have any doubts, well, then it's not as much. And you know, that's not what James is saying. And part of that is that even it really goes against the whole nature of prayer because, okay, what differentiates somebody that's healed or not? Well, it's, it's not God, it's my own faith. My faith made the difference. No, that's not, that's not biblical. Um, and it's actually a very dangerous idea because I've dealt with a lot of people. There may be some of you who have been taught this idea, and I've dealt with people who have been taught this idea who are in the middle of a crisis, and they're told, if you have enough faith, God will heal you. And then you pray, and God doesn't heal. And do you know what happens when we've been taught that? Suddenly the person says, well, if I'm not healed, 
I must have failed. Because it promises if I have enough faith, then God would heal me. So I not only now am dealing with the sickness or the problem of the crisis, but I'm also dealing with the guilt that somehow I failed God because it, my faith isn't enough. So how do I prove it? And, and friends, that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, I, there's a great passage in Mark chapter 9 that describes a prayer of faith, and it's something that's radically different than this unquestioning, no doubting perspective. It actually, it's... It's a prayer that may include doubts. In Mark chapter 9, there's a story about this dad who comes to Jesus, and he asks Jesus to heal his son that's been demon-possessed. And and, and Jesus looks at him and says, okay, do you have faith? And his response is basically, I don't know. I mean, look at his response, Mark 9. Uh, he He says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. What he's saying is, I believe, I have faith, but I don't. I have a faith, but I have doubts. I have faith, but it's not. It's not without doubts. It's not certain. And you see him coming with this faith that's faith in, in, in a big Jesus, but a faith that's weak. And Jesus turns around and says, Your faith is, you know, your, by your faith he's healed. That's enough. That's, that's saving faith. That's, that's the prayer of faith. It's a prayer of faith that includes doubts. Because our faith, it isn't our bigness of our faith that saves, it's, the, it's a mustard seed faith, a tiny bit of faith in the big God. But faith is something that, that could include doubt, it can include struggle. So then what is the prayer of faith? The Bible teaches that the prayer of faith is it's an expression of faith in the character of God. See, as we look at this, we've got to understand, you know, we're, it's, it's, this, what this is teaching is in the context of everything that the Bible teaches. And when you think about faith, it's an expression in the whole character of God. Usually when people talk about the prayer of faith, they're talking just about faith in God's power. I have faith that God has the power to heal, and if I believe enough that God has the power, then he will. And my friends, true faith in God is not just in his power, but it's in his character, it's in his goodness, in his wisdom, and in, in, in who he is. See, this is something that is totally consistent with what James taught earlier in James chapter 1. In James 1, he talked about trials. And he says that we're going to go through periods of trial, tri- times that things go, are broken, things that, you know, that we go through crisis in life. Look what he says, James 1, starting in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking anything. God is growing our faith so that we have a mature faith, but how does he do that? By allowing us to face trials, crises, sickness, things that he knows that are for our good that he allows to continue on. It doesn't mean, well, if you have a trial, if you believe, he's going to remove it. No, it's saying he's going to let you have a trial, and even if you have faith, he's going to let you continue to go through it because that's how he grows your faith. And so the prayer of faith is an expression and confidence in all of God's character. It's not just, it starts with, yes, his, his power. I believe that God is powerful. I believe that he can heal. I believe that he is a great physician, but I also believe that he's omniscient that he knows everything, that he knows things that I don't know. I believe that he's sovereign, that he has a plan, and I may not always understand his plan. I believe that he's all loving and that his promises that he gives, like in James 1, 2, uh, that I can count it joy because he always has a good purpose. I believe all those things about God. And when I believe that, the prayer of faith is a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer where we not only show our faith and God's, our confidence in God's ability to heal, but we also show our faith and confidence in his character, that we trust that he knows what's best. We trust his character to accept whatever form of healing that it might take. And let me give you an example of this kind of faith, this kind of prayer of faith. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on the fire furnace in Daniel chapter 3. For those of us that were raised on veggie tales, Rack, Shack, and Benny, Benny, you know, you just, you know, and, and here you have the story that you have these three men that are told, unless you deny, you know, and, and go sit down and, and worship the statue and deny God, you're going to be thrown in the, in the, in the uh, fire furnace. And look at their statement of faith. 
It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this moment. You know, we're standing before God. We're confident in God's power. Then they continue, If this be so, if you throw us in the furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So we have total confidence in God's power, but then they continue on. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Basically, they're saying, we have total faith in God's power, but we also have total faith in his, in his character. And God can heal us, he can deliver us, but, but since we don't know God's mind, he may choose not to. And even if he chooses not to, we're going to believe in God's character. We have the prayer of faith in his character that are going to believe even if he works the way that we hope that he will or the way if he doesn't, if he works in a way that we don't understand. See, it's a prayer of faith and confidence in who God is and his plan and purpose. The approach for many in faith healing is, is, is basically not only do I have faith in God's power, but I have faith in my knowledge. It's this approach that says, because, I, because God's healing, and I know that God wants to heal me, that, that I'm sure that this is the right plan, and therefore I'm going to claim it, and I'm going to just, God, you've got to heal, because that's what I know what's right. I want to tell you, there are times that I've been with people that have been sick. You know, I've done funerals of, of, of children, of, of young parents. And there are times I don't understand that. And I've prayed with those families. And in my mind, it's, God, I think you should heal them, and I don't understand that you don't. I acknowledge I don't understand that. God has the power. And it may, I may not always understand. That's this challenge. James 1.5, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, which you will, we're going to go through times that we can't figure out God's mindset. We can't, it doesn't make sense. You see, but faith in God means humility in ourselves and says, okay, God, I'm going to be okay if there are going to be times that I don't understand, that you don't deliver from the fiery furnace. And, and I have faith in your character that is able to believe if you work and do the miracle or if you don't do the miracle that I'm praying for. Now, when we do that, we come and we say, okay, the first is a prayer of faith. And, but it's also a prayer of faith that includes the anointing with oil. Look what it says in verse four, 14. If any among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, I think there are a couple possible meanings of what this anointing with oil is. One is that it could be medicine. The other is that it's a meaning and it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And you ask, well, which one is it? And the answer is yes. Um, yeah, it's, 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 actually, it's both of them. Okay, what is the first? The first is medicine. That in that day, oil was a common medicine. You think of that Luke chapter 10, and you have the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this guy is beat up, and the Samaritan comes and tends his wounds by pouring oil and wine on them. Oil was, was seen as a medicine. It would loosen the wound, clean the wound. The wine was an antiseptic. It was medical. And so I think part of what is being said here is that James is saying is that prayer doesn't necessarily need to replace medical treatment. Some people will say, well, I'm going to pray and I'm not going to go to the doctor because I need to prove that I'm relying on God. My friends, that God heals. And sometimes he heals through medicine. Sometimes he heals apart from medicine. But I don't think that he's called us to seek in prayer and to avoid medical treatment. Not at all. That, that I think that is totally consistent for us seeking God's healing at the same time to to, to seek what medical treatment is allowed. God has ordained and, and created medicine. Um, medical arts are a gift of God, and God uses that. But at the same time, you know, grace isn't replacing nature, but at the same time, we recognize that we need more than medicine. We need more than medical treatment. The doctors don't know everything. The medicines don't work all the time. And so part of the prayer is coming and saying, God, I'm seeking your healing through medicine, but also, you see, the Oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You think for a good example of that is you have David when he was anointed king. He was anointed with oil. And numerous times you would have anointing with oil saying, what I need is the Spirit to come upon me. I need God's grace. And God has called us at that same time to say, God, I'm, I'm doing all that I can, but I need something more. God, I need you to, and whether you work through medical means or apart from medical means, I need the Holy Spirit to come and do something. I need a miracle. 
And this is something that we believe. We, we, as a church, we believe that God has called us to this kind of ministry, that if you're sick, call the elders, so that we come alongside of you, we pray, we anoint with oil, because this is as part of what God has called us to do. So it's not only this anointing with oil, but it's also then the, also the confession of sins. Look at verse 15 and 16. It says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now we have to ask, okay, what is he saying here? He's talking about this personal confession of known sins. Now again, there are some wrong ideas here. Some people take this to mean that if you're sick, it's because you have sin. If you're sick, it's because there's some unconfessed sin in your life and, and that's caused the sickness and if you confess it, God will remove it. My friends, that's not biblical. I mean, there's a passage where Jesus, uh, you know, there's a man that's blind, and, and the disciples look to Jesus. You know, who caused his blindness? Was it his sin or his parents? And Jesus said, no, you got it all wrong. No, sin does not cause sickness in most cases. Now, what is it saying here, though? It's saying that while unconfessed sin may not be the cause of our sickness, unconfessed sin does hinder God's answering our prayer. Now, that's taught numerous places in Scripture. So while sin may not cause our sickness, unconfessed sin may hinder God's healing. So that if I have a problem and I say, God, I need you to come and work in this way, and meanwhile we have unconfessed sin, there's a sense where God is going to say, well, first of all, you deal with the part here that I want to heal, and then we'll talk about this part. Why? Because here's what's happening. God's saying, I'm trying to make you aware. I want to do surgery in your heart. I want to do healing. And part of it is not only the physical healing or the healing of this crisis, but it's a spiritual healing of the heart. But if you say, God, I don't want to surrender here. I don't want this relationship. I don't want to, I don't want to do the part that you want me to do. I just, I just want to use you. Why would we think that God would answer that prayer? Remember that God often uses crisis to draw us, you know, make us aware of our need and draw us back into relationship with him. And so when we're in that crisis and we're saying, God, God, I have this need, it's also a time that we need to say, God, is there something you're pointing out in my life? Is there something I need to surrender? Is there something that I need to, to confess? And, and the fact is, is that any of our prayers are going to be hindered is, in, until we're willing to surrender those things before God. Now, when we do, then there's a promise. Now, look at this promise. There's a promise of healing. Look at verse 14 again. If any of you amongst you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church. Let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. That doesn't say that the prayer of faith may save. It says it will save. It says the, the, the Lord will raise him up. It's a promise. Now, what in the world does that mean? Because again, there are many of us that we've prayed for loved ones that weren't healed physically. So how do we understand this? Well, we've got to realize that it's not a guarantee of, 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 guarantee of physical healing. And, and again, some have understood that and they become buried in frustration. See, one of the rules that we've got to remember is, is at any time you look at Scripture, if there's an unclear passage to try to understand it, you go to more clear passages there's a basic rule that, you know, Scripture interprets Scripture. And, um, and we've got to look at that. And, you know, how do we understand and, and use Scripture here to interpret this? Some people look at it, and they don't look at Scripture, and they're saying, well, I need to prove, and prayer of faith is proving to God how much I believe, and then I'm sure I'm going to get healed. I mean, I remember somebody who was, had cancer, and he prayed for healing, and God didn't heal him, and he just needed to prove his faith, and so he gave up his life insurance policy to prove that he had total faith in God. And then he died, and his family was, was not cared for. See, that's not what it's guaranteeing. It's not that prayer of faith. It's not saying you will always be healed physically. Scripture interprets Scripture. Let me take you to a passage where it talks about healing, and we've got to see this promise in the context of this teaching. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 Paul's talking about his own sickness and his seeking God's healing. Starting in verse 7, it says, For to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. He had some kind of physical problem. A messenger from Satan harassed me to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So he's coming before God, and three times he prays before God. 
Now, here's a guy that you're pretty sure Paul has enough faith. That's not his problem. But look at God's response to him. Verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So he has a physical ailment. He prays God doesn't heal him physically. But yet there's a promise of healing. The promise of James is the Lord will raise that person up. Was Paul healed? Yes. Look at what he says. Look at what he says in his own words. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not going to heal you that way because my power is made perfect in weakness. So what does he say? I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness. I'm healed because I see God's purpose. He went from someone who was defeated by his struggles to someone who wasn't healed physically, but yet there was a healing. There was something that, that God did. See, my friends, it's not about just believing in God's strength to heal physically. It's about believing in God's purpose and his plan. See, this promise is defined by the whole purpose of prayer, the nature of prayer. See, when we think about prayer of faith, it's just this prayer of, okay, I've got to prove it, and, and, and then God's going to do it, and God's going to accomplish it. The way that people often interpret that is that prayer becomes a, about us making our case to God, somehow talking God into things. God, here, let me explain to you why this is the right thing. Let me explain to you why this is a good idea, and just in case you didn't know. And if I explain it to you, argue with you, well, then you're going to agree with me. Or, or it's performance. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? You don't want me to sell my insurance? Do you want me to, how do I prove that I'm in faith? And we see it as a way of somehow changing God's mind informing him or performing so that we can change his mind. Is that what prayer is about? Is it about changing God's mind? No. That's inconsistent with the rest of Scripture. It's not about changing God's mind. It's about bringing our hurts and our concerns before God so that he can change our heart. It's not about me changing him. It's about him changing me. It's not a process where it's trying to figure out how I can press God's buttons and perform for him so that he does what I know what is best. It's about me coming before God with a prayer of faith and saying, God, I believe in all that you are. And here's my heart, and there's sometimes that I pour out my heart, and he changes me, and then he does the thing that I'm asking. And there are other times that I pray, and I say, God, here's my heart. God, you answer it the way you want. And he changes my heart so that I'm able to see a miracle that's different than what I was pursuing, different than I was asking. Prayer is a surrender by which God changes us. And if we understand that, we see prayer in a totally different way. See, if we see prayer as something that we're changing, God, we're always negotiating, we're always explaining to him. If we see prayer as a relationship, it, it changes the things. Now, does God heal? Yes. There are times that God does heal physically. Does he do supernatural? Yes, he does. And I've seen it. And some people say, well, I've never seen that. I've never, you know, I've seen it personally. Yeah, I, I, way back when, I was involved in a serious accident, and I had a you know, serious neck con uh, injury, and I had a really bad concussion, and I had a broken bone in my throat. And because of the broken bone, even I was in the hospital, and, and I, I couldn't eat. Everything had to be, you know, be sent through the blender. And, but they couldn't operate on me because my concussion was so bad. And I had some people that came and support and were praying with me. And Well, then a couple days later, they go to do the operation on my, on my throat, and they do a final x-ray to make sure, and they're like, they come back, and they're like, here's, we don't know what happened. There's no break in the bone anymore. And, and suddenly, you know, they have the two x-rays, and here's one. It's clearly broken. The other one isn't broken. They're like, we don't know what happened. We can't explain it. Now, that's a miracle. God did a healing on that broken bone. At the same point, I still had the concussion and the neck problems that took me months to recover from. Now, why did God heal one and he didn't heal the other? I don't know. I've been with people that they've had cancer and then they go back and they, you know, they, take, they take a last scan and it's like, man, we see, we see the indent where the cancer used to be. God heals. But I've been with other people where God hasn't healed physically and I, we prayed for him and he doesn't and I don't know why. But God does heal. But the healing isn't always going to be physical. Part of that is coming and saying, God, I'm willing to come and take the surrender to faith. 
I think a great example of that is a guy down in, in our church in, in, in South Carolina. This guy had a stroke, and we prayed for him, he, 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 physical healing, and, and it didn't happen, it didn't happen. And this guy had been somebody that had been very much a, uh, uh, you know, his, his family were believers, and he was very skeptical. But I remember the day that we were there in service, he started coming to church, you know, and he, was, he could barely talk, you know, couldn't walk, he could barely talk, and I remember the day, you know, we're finishing up, and, and, and he's in his wheelchair right up in the front of the church, and he starts waving me over with his hand, he can't move that well, and, and I come over, and I said, Bill, what's, and he, and he says, I want, I want, and I said, what, and he grabs my shirt, and he pulls me, he says, I want, I want, so you want to accept Christ? Yes, you know, and, and he accepted Christ, and here's a guy that, in the years that I saw him after that, that he wasn't healed physically, he had far more joy than he ever had than when he was total physical. Why? Because God healed. God did a miracle. It wasn't physical, but God did a miracle. And, and this is a promise that God will heal, that God will do some kind of miracle. It just is we have to be willing to say, God, I come and bring that need. I pray for this miracle, but I'm willing to surrender to whatever miracle you want to give me. See, it's a prayer of faith. What is God calling us to do to practically, to bring our need to God with a prayer of faith? What does it say? If any of you amongst you sick, let him call the elders of the church. Let him pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And what is it saying? First of all, if you're sick, if you have a physical problem, any kind of problem, you need to call us. If we do this, it is a joy and privilege for us to be able to meet with people and pray and anoint with oil. But, but you need to call us and say, would you come and pray for us? You have to initiate it. That's what it's saying. You call the elders. And please do that. The more that we do that, the happier we're going to And we really love doing this as elders. So it's something that you need to initiate with the prayer of faith, but it's faith in God's character. Where we come and we bring the concern and need that we have. We pray for physical healing, but at the same point, we pray with confidence that there's going to be a miracle, and Lord, help us to accept whatever form that miracle takes. And sometimes it's going to be physical healing. And there's going to be no other explanation. And, and sometimes it's going to be a, a miracle. There's a blessing that, that isn't necessarily what we were looking for, but Lord, help us to learn to be able to embrace that as something that is good. Because it's a prayer that's surrendering and trusting in God's will. And the fact that we're not only confident in God and in and, and, and his power, but we're confident in faith in God's character. That we're not trying to negotiate because a lot of times what happens is we'll come and we'll say, God, we're going to negotiate. If I do this, you know, God, if you heal me, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to, you know, that we negotiate and we perform or we inform. And no, it's not about negotiating. It's not about performing for God. It's about submitting and surrendering. Coming, bringing our need, bringing our, because God wants us to bring it before him. And if we, you know, didn't seek after him, he, he invites us by grace. He wants that relationship with us. But when we come and we surrender and recognizing that it will change things. Prayer does change things. Prayer works miracles. And I really believe, and I've seen it with so many times that we've prayed with people and I've seen so many miracles and some of them are physical and some of them aren't. But prayer does miracles. We need to pray. We desperately need to pray. And I hope that we can encourage each other to pray for each other in our community groups, amongst our, 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 you know, pray in your own life and ask the elders to pray for you. Let us be a community of prayer where we pray for each other and recognize that we bring those needs. And God wants to heal, and his healing starts not just with the physical and the body, but healing of our heart, of our soul. Healing not only the surface levels, but the deepest of things. That God works in miraculous ways and does miraculous things in our lives. Are you willing to come to him? Are you willing to pursue him and, and, and pursue that relationship, the power of that healing that comes from that? Let me pray, and then we're going to end with communion this morning. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege that we do have to come together this morning, Father, to be able to, to, be able to, to, be able to dive into these truths. Father, I thank you. I pray that you would help us to understand, Father, and to see your invitation to grace. Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have, even this morning, to recognize that it's not about performing, it's about accepting what you have done for us, and that's symbolized by, by this, by the cross, by communion. Father, we thank you. We pray your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen.